listen carefully to this reading of God's most holy word. When Balaam saw that it pleased the Lord to bless Israel, he did not go as at the other times to look for omens, but set his face toward the wilderness. And Balaam lifted up his eyes and saw Israel camping tribe by tribe. And the Spirit of God came upon him, and he took up his discourse and said, The oracle of Balaam, the son of Beor, the oracle of a man whose eye is open, the oracle of him who hears the words of God, who sees the visions of the Almighty, falling down with his eyes uncovered, how lovely are your tents, O Jacob, your encampments, O Israel, like palm groves that stretch afar, like gardens beside a river, like aloes that the Lord has planted, like cedar trees beside the waters. Waters shall flow from his buckets, and his seed shall be in many waters. His king shall be higher than Agag, and his kingdom shall be exalted. God brings him out of Egypt, and he is for him like the horns of a wild ox. He shall eat up the nations, his adversaries, and shall break their bones in pieces, and pierce them through with his arrows. He crouched, he laid down like a lion, and like a lioness who will rouse him up. Blessed are those who bless you, and cursed are those who curse you. May the Lord add his blessing to this reading of his most holy word. Let us pray. Our gracious Father and God, how once again we thank you for this opportunity to learn from your most holy word. Father, we ask that as we come before you, that you would give us your Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us in your truth. That you would help us to receive your word with faith and love to lay it up in our hearts and to practice it in our lives. And for this we bless you and we thank you and we praise you in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The Bible reminds us that as a minister of the gospel, I have an obligation to preach God's word to you. But the question arises, how are we to preach God's word, or what specifically are we to preach? And there is, as we know, that method of preaching and approaching God's word as an expository way of looking and proclaiming God's word, book by book, verse by verse, epistle by epistle. But also, the scripture says to us that we are to preach systematically. We are to talk about the different doctrines that the Bible speaks about. What does the Bible teach us about the doctrine of God, the doctrine of Christ, the doctrine of man, the doctrine of salvation? In a way that comprehends or expounds all of these great truths. You see, there's not any one place in the Bible that tells us everything that the scripture teaches us about God. And unless I'm going to somehow just kind of piecemeal the doctrine of God as I go through the different scriptures, there are times and places where I'm called upon by God to set out and before you those great truths about what the scripture teaches us concerning God, who he is, how he relates to us. Another way that the Bible reminds us that I am responsible to bring God and his majesty before you is to remind you of the mighty acts of God, those great works that God has done where he's demonstrated his faithfulness, his loving kindness, his mercy to his people. In fact, the psalmist in Psalm 145, a psalm of David, David says, I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever, because great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. Therefore, one generation shall commend your works to another, and they shall declare your mighty acts. 
on the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works, I will meditate. Tonight, as I am going to open up God's word to you, I'm going to open it in one of those mighty acts of God. But why particularly did I choose this mighty act of God that we read a little bit about and that I'll talk a little bit more about as we look at the book of Numbers, chapter 24? Why this particular text? Well, it's quite interesting to me that if you look at Paul's epistle to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, he says to us, Brothers, I want you to know that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea and they all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now notice what he says. Now these things took place as examples for us that we might not desire evil as they did. So therefore we're not to be idolaters as they are idolaters. And he goes and begins to expand to them or expound to them out of the book of Numbers. These things specifically he's saying to us in this text in the book of Numbers were written to us as examples. Therefore, let anyone thinks that he stands, take heed, lest he fall also. Because these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction. So here the Apostle Paul, and especially as he is dealing with the Corinthian church, and remember what he goes on to deal with them in chapter 11 about is their coming to the Lord's table, which we will be coming to tonight. But he calls their attention in chapter 10 to these mighty acts of God in the book of Numbers and says, you're to remember because God has written them for us as examples. They are given to us for our learning. So we should meditate often on those mighty acts that are recorded for us there in the uh, Old Testament. But someone might ask me the question, but why the story of Balaam and Balak? Why do we turn our attention to this particular story? Well, you know, quite frankly, there are a number of places in the Bible that tells us to look at specific places. And the Bible tells us that we are to specifically look at this story. Micah chapter 6 and verse 5. Oh, my people. Remember what Balak, king of Moab, devised, and what Balaam, the son of Beor, answered him, and what happened from Shittim to Gilgal, that ye may know the saving acts of the Lord. God gives a specific commandment in his scripture, not only that we are to look at the Old Testament and look at the mighty acts of God and see what God has done to bring salvation to his people, but he actually tells us this particular passage, this passage which is recorded for us in Numbers 22 through the end of Numbers 24, we are to specifically look at and meditate upon and to think about what the Lord is teaching us concerning his work of salvation. Now, one of the things that we are going to basically learn from here and why I think that the Lord specifically teaches us to look at this particular section of his holy word in the Old Testament book of Numbers is because of what our shorter catechism reminds us that we are to remember and to know and understand that Christ as our Redeemer executes the offices of a prophet, of a priest, and of a king, both in his estate of humiliation and exaltation, and that Christ executes the office of a king by subduing us unto himself, in ruling and defending us, and in restraining and conquering all his and our enemies. 
So really what's going on here is I believe that we are basically seeing King Jesus looking out for his people. And it is to be an encouragement to us, as the Apostle Paul says, that these things are written for our instruction, that we might be encouraged, and that we as God's people might walk in the sure hope that comes through faith in Jesus Christ. So let's look at this particular passage. First of all, to look and understand what really is happening here in the book of Numbers, chapter 22 to 24, when we have this story about the king of Moab and this soothsayer from Mesopotamia, is that God is in the midst of his people. Chapters 1 through chapter 10 and verse 10 basically are giving us God's great migration as he leads his people out of Egypt into the promised land. The Bible tells us that the children of Israel, having been encamped for a season at Mount Sinai, had received from God the Ark of the Covenant, God's holy dwelling place, that symbol that demonstrated to Israel that God stood in their midst. He wasn't a God far off. He wasn't a God outside of his people, but he was a God who stood and dwelled in the midst of his people. And when they marched, when they journeyed in the wilderness, the Ark of the Covenant was to rest in the middle with three tribes on the north, three tribes on the south, three tribes on the east, and three tribes on the west. They were to march with full flowing banners. They were marching and singing praise to God as they journeyed through the wilderness. There was over two million people that came out of the nation of Egypt. And so can you imagine the parade? Yesterday, Kathleen and I were down in Florence, South Carolina, having a graduation breakfast with our son. And as we left to come up here to uh, Raleigh, we couldn't get out of Florence because they had this parade. Now there were a few bands. There were some young people riding uh, bicycles and doing things. It was a very small parade. But the streets were lined with spectators, all enjoying this Spectacle of a very small parade. Can you imagine the parade that God was leading as he went through the wilderness with two million people surrounding him, singing praise and giving glory and honor to his name? And that news going from place to place. You see, as the children of Israel came out of Egypt, remember the story of Egypt. God says to Moses, Go and tell Pharaoh to let my people go. So Moses goes to Pharaoh and says, Thus saith the Lord, let my people go. And what does Pharaoh say? Who is the Lord that I should obey him? And God gave Pharaoh ten answers. These are the reasons why you should obey me. We know them as the ten plagues. And what is the response of Pharaoh at the end? Let the people go. Now that news has traveling... And as that news goes from place to place, as this mighty parade of God begins to march through the wilderness, all of these people that are round about have become fearful, as it were. Now, when we get to chapter 13 of the book of Numbers, what we see is that there is a glitch. Israel rebels against the Lord. And so instead of making a straight path into the promised land, they are diverted by God to wander for 38 years through the wilderness. And they literally just wandered in circles. If you follow the path as it goes along, they're just kind of wandering around, circling here, there, and everywhere as they are in the wilderness. Because God says, because of your rebellion, this first generation won't enter my land. And until all this generation passes away, you'll just keep wandering. And during that wilderness wandering, God is removing that generation. Chapter 11, they murmured, and God brings the serpents. Chapter 12 and 16, they rebel. God brings um, leprosy on Miriam. He destroys Korah and all his followers. Chapter 14, because of their faith, unfaithfulness, their wandering is hard. 
idolatry and immor immorality in chapter 25 brings a plague upon them. God is systematically removing this rebellious generation. Now they've wandered for 38 years. And really this is where chapter 22 of the book of Numbers picks up. They've wandered for 38 years and they've now come to the plains of Moab which is the last stop before they enter into the promised land. It's in this last place that the final individuals of that last generation pass away, except for Joshua and Caleb, and it is the place where God does take Moses home. So now they are making final preparations. The last act that Moses does is actually writes the book of Deuteronomy. Why does he write the second law. Well, he said, because this second generation wasn't around when God gave us the first law, and so they need to be reminded. And so he writes the second law for this new generation that's going to go into the promised land. Well, in the meantime, while they're down there camped in the valley of Moab, Balak, the king of Moab, says, we got to do something because they're going to wipe us out. This army that left Egypt 38 years earlier of 2,000 has now become multiple, or uh, 2 million has now become multiple millions of people. And Balak says, we need to get rid of them. Which is very interesting because actually Balak is a descendant of Lot, the nephew of Abraham. If anything, Balaam should have been very amiable to the children of Israel, letting them pass through the region of Moab and enter into the promised land. But he doesn't. What he does is he sends for a soothsayer. He sends for a witch doctor from Mesopotamia, one that had a great reputation. That reputation was anyone he blessed was blessed, and anyone he cursed was <coughs> cursed. Now before we talk a little bit about what actually transpires here, let's ask ourselves a question. Was Balaam a good guy or a bad guy? Often I talk to Christians and I ask them about Balaam, what they think about Balaam and when we're talking about prophets in the Old Testament because many have said that Balaam was a prophet of God and they don't understand. They look and they say, well, it says here in the book of Numbers that Balak was prophesying on the Lord. The oracles of Balaam, the son of Beor, the oracles of the man whose eyes is open, the oracles of him who hears the words of God. Right away we think, well, Balaam must have been a good guy and not a bad guy. Well, there's some hints that we are given here in this context and also in the New Testament that I think we need to take into consideration. First of all, he was originally and firstly commanded by God not to go to Balak, but he goes and God brings judgment upon him. Secondly, in this verse, verse 1 of chapter 24, he basically talks about using enchantments. When Balaam saw that it pleased the Lord to bless Israel, he did not go as at other time to look for omens. Moses is quite clear in the book of Exodus that a true prophet of God, in the book of Deuteronomy, a true prophet of God is not one who uses omens. They are not to be like the other prophets of the people or the other soothsayers or witch doctors of the nation. Chapter 22 and verse 31, along with chapter 31, verse 8, talks about the judgments of God that comes upon Balaam for his disobedience. Chapter 31, verse 16 says that as one who is deceived the nation of Israel, he leads the people into idolatry, which brings upon that nation the judgment of God. But we also have New Testament testimony about the character of Balaam as we would look at this particular text. One, the Bible says to us in 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 15, 
that Balaam loved gain from wrongdoing. In fact, Peter exhorts the people, don't be a people that love gain from wrongdoing as Balaam was. So Balaam is an example to the New Testament church of the way they are not to be as opposed to the way they ought to live before the Lord. The Bible tells us in Jude's epistle, Jude 11, for the sake of gain, Balaam led the people into error. And that when we are those who are called upon to contend for the faith, we are not to contend for faith on the basis of gain as Balaam did. Remember the story, the king, Balak keeps offering Balaam money. You come and do this and I'll give you up to half of my kingdom. But then also Revelation chapter 2 and verse 14, when Jesus is bringing warning to the church of Pergamum, he says to them, do not follow Balaam's heir, which led the people into idolatry and immorality. That's what they were doing. They were following the heir of Balaam and not following the Lord Jesus Christ. And so judgment is being brought upon the church in Pergamum because of their following Balaam and not following our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Balak basically is beside himself. Chapter 22, we're told that he's not quite sure what to do. Then the people of Israel set out and they encamped in the plains of Moab beyond the Jordan at Jericho. And Balak, the son of Zippor, saw that all of Israel saw all that Israel had done to the Amorites. And Moab was in great dread of the people because they were many. So Moab was overcome with fear of the people of Israel. And Moab said to the elders of Midian, the horde will now lick up all that is around us as an ox licks up grass of the field. You ever been in a place where cattle move through a, a lawn or move through a field and they eat everything, goats are even worse. The Bible says here that Israel's going to eat up Moab even as the cows eat up the grass. So the elders of Moab and the elders of Midian departed with the fees for divination in their hand and they came to Balaam and they gave him Balak's message. Come, curse Israel and we will pay you. Well, Balaam seeks answers. In chapter 22, he goes to the Lord twice. First time the Lord says, don't go. But the elders come a second time and they entice him. And the second time God says to him, God came to Balaam at night and said to him, if the men have come to call you, rise, go with them, but only do what I tell you. So Balaam rose in the morning and saddled his donkey and went with the princes to Moab. Now at first blush, it seems to us that what's taking place here is that Balaam is being obedient to the Lord, even though the Lord had told him at first that he was not to go. He tells him the second time that he was to go with this provisio, that he was only to do that which God tells him. But then verse 22 goes on and says, but God's anger was kindled because he went. And the angel of the Lord took his stand in the way at his adversary. Now that doesn't make a whole lot of sense to us. God said, don't go. But then God said the second time, go ahead and go. Balaam starts off with the uh, elders from the land of Moab and God rebukes him for going. And it basically is, remember, the Bible teaches us, as our confession says, what makes a work good? It's got to be done to, according to the commandments or the law of God. It's got to be done with the right attitude out of faith in God. And it's got to be done for the right goal, which is the glory of God. What Balaam does not do here is a righteous work of God. His motive for going is what, the Bible tells us gain. 
His goal is his own advancement. So even though it appears that he is obeying God's voice and going as God has told him, he's not really. And God's anger is set against Balaam as he goes. And this introduces us to the third encounter that he has with God. He's halted in the way. He's riding along, he's riding his donkey, and suddenly his donkey turns aside. Balaam gets pretty angry, switches his donkey with his stick a few times and tries to redirect him in the way. The donkey refuses again, turns aside. Balaam hits him again. He goes for the third time. The donkey refuses, this time falling all the way down. Balaam gets up, rebukes the donkey, and the donkey talks back to him. What in the world are you hitting me for? Haven't you been writing me your whole life? And have I ever once, have I ever once disobeyed you or not carried you to where you led me? And then God opens the eyes of Balaam so he sees the angel of the Lord standing in the way. And the angel of the Lord says, you should bless God that your donkey stopped. Because if he would have come forward, I would have struck you dead. If he had taken one step closer, you would be before my judgment seat for all of eternity. And then God says to Balaam, go and do exactly what I tell you to do. So Balaam continues his journey to meet with Balak. Balak meets him for this first time and basically says, now I want you to go up and curse Israel. And so Balaam said to Balak, build for me here seven altars and prepare for me here seven bulls and seven rams. Balaam did as Balak had said, and Balak and Balaam offered on each altar a bull and a ram. And Balaam said to Balak, stand beside your burnt offering and I will go. Perhaps the Lord will come to meet me and whatever he shows me, I will tell you. And he went up into the heights and God met Balaam and Balaam said to him I have arranged the seven altars and I have offered on each altar a bull and a ram and the Lord put a word in Balaam's mouth and he said return to Balak and thus shall ye speak and he returned verse 23 or excuse me verse 10 of chapter 23 tells us that instead of Cursing Israel as Balak had wanted. That when Balaam opens his mouth, he blesses Israel and said that they would be a people without number. Who can count the dust of Jacob? Or number even a fourth part of Israel? Let me die the death of the upright and let my end be like his. And Balak looks at Balaam and says, what have you done to me? I took you to curse my enemies and behold, you have done nothing but bless them. And Balak's answer was, I couldn't do anything else. I was compelled by God to bless the people. Second time that Balak or Balaam seeks to curse God's people. Chapter 23, beginning at verse uh, 18, and Balaam took up his discourse and says the second time, again, a blessing comes out, not a curse. And this time, in verse 19, it says, God is not man that he should lie, or the son of man that he should change his mind. Has he said, and will it not be so? Or has he spoken, and will he not fulfill it? You see, God is a God of his word. God has made a covenant with Israel, and God will not revoke. God will not turn away from his covenant. God will keep his promise to Israel, even in the face of enemies like Balaam and Balak. And then in the text that we read this evening, chapter 24 and verse 5, 
God says, I will give you a land. The oracle of Balaam, the son of Beor, the oracle of a man whose eyes are open, the oracle of him who hears the word of God, who sees the vision of the Almighty falling down with his eyes uncovered. How lovely are your tents, O Jacob, your encampments, O Israel. Like palm groves, they will stretch far, like gardens beside a river, like aloes that the Lord has pointed. There will be this land, a land that overflows with milk and honey, that has every blessing God is going to give to his people Israel, and not a single John or tittle of his promise will fail until they have received and possess it all. And then in chapter 24, in verse 17, the final oracle. The oracle of Balaam, the son of Beor, the oracle of man whose eye is open, the oracle of him who hears the words of God and knows the knowledge of the Most High, who sees the vision of the Almighty, falling down with his eyes uncovered. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel, and it will crush the forehead of Moab and break down all the sons of Sheph, Edom shall be dispossessed. Seir also his enemies shall be deposed. Israel is doing valiantly. A prophecy that is telling us that Christ will fulfill that original prophecy that was given in the Garden of Eden. That the seed of the woman would crush the head of the seed of the serpent. That there was one who was coming even a savior king who would crush Moab and Edom and the Amorites and every enemy that raised its head against God because God stood for his people. God's mighty act, what God was doing. And all of this was going on. Israel's down the valley. They don't even see what's happening. They don't hear what's going on between Balaam and Balak. They don't understand that God has overshadowed them, that God is protecting them. They're simply preparing themselves on the plains of Moab to go in the promised land. But our God is a God who neither sleeps nor slumbers. He's a God who is an ever-present help in the time of need. He is a God, and these are the truths we learn in this passage. He is a God who sovereign disposition, who moves and works in the affairs of men. Listen, you and I live in the midst of a world that seems to be falling apart at the seams. We are like in our valley of Moab. But God is not a God who is afar off. He is not a God who is asleep. He's not a God who has left his people. But even in the midst of our valley of Moab, God stands over us, watching over us. And though the Balaams of our world seek to bring destruction and curse upon God's people, when they open their mouth, they only bless. They can do no other. Because God holds his people in the palm of his hand, just like he held the children of Israel in the palm of his hand, and would bring them to be a people without number. Listen, my friends, the Bible says to us, when we get to heaven, it's not going to be a small little number that stand before the throne of his grace. That God gave a promise to Abraham that there would be a seed from among the nations that would be greater than the stars of heaven and the sands of the seashore. And God is telling us that he will fulfill his promise, that he is all powerful to protect us from every enemy and everyone who would seek to destroy us. Because God's sovereign disposition is wrought and carried out in the affairs of men. It's easy for us. Again, I remember back, it's, it's, it, in some ways, for those of you who didn't live back then, it's like being in the 1960s again. In the 1960s, in the midst of the Cold War, we were constantly being told that there was some maniac somewhere that was going to put his finger on a button and destroy the whole world. 
that there would be a nuclear holocaust and that we would practice getting under our desks like there was some safety in climbing under a desk in a classroom if some idiot sent an atom bomb. And we're hearing the same thing today. There is some lunatic that's trying to scare the world that he's going to destroy it. And what God says is, I hold the world in the palm of my hand and my people ought not to be afraid. There is no Balaam. There is no Balak. There is no Saddam Hussein. There is no Kim Jong-un. There is no one who is able to pluck my children out of the palm of my hand. I will not lose a single one, but I will bless my people according to my word. I will give them the land that flows with milk and honey because I have gone to prepare a place for them. And where I go to prepare a place, I will come again and receive them unto myself that where I am there, they may be also. So Jesus said, don't let your hearts be troubled, neither be afraid. Because God's rule is all powerful and cannot be thwarted. God's covenant faithfulness in the lives of his people. You see, God has made to us promises. All that come unto me, I will in no wise cast out. Though the pestilence stalks by night and the arrow flies by day, we have no fear because our God is a faithful shield and buckler. He is our strong and mighty tower, our shield of defense. And God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should be thwarted. But he is faithful in his word never proves false or untrue. His word is powerful. So God works. God's working in, think about this. God blessed Israel through the mouth of a greedy soothsayer at the beckoning of an unrighteous king. God blessed Israel through the unsatiated greed of a witch doctor and at the unbridled authority and power-hungry king to say, I will accomplish my purposes in the nations of men. I will cross the head of the seed of the serpent, and I will raise victoriously and rule over all nations. How does Christ execute the office of a king? Christ executes the office of a king in subduing us to himself. Brothers and sisters, we're going to come to the Lord's table this evening. And as we come to the Lord's table, it calls us to remember calling us to remember one of the mighty acts of God. In remembering that mighty act of God, we are called to remember that our God as King has subdued us unto Himself. That we were once lost in our trespasses and sins, that we were dead, we were without hope, there was nothing that we could do to change ourselves, and God, by His grace, saved us. He caused us to turn unto him. He raised us from our spiritual death because he is king. He executes the office of a king by subduing us to himself. We've been subdued. We were subdued by Christ as he spoke to us in the preaching of the word, as he wooed and drawn us by his Holy Spirit unto himself. He turned us from sin and gave us strength. He gave us power that we might embrace Jesus Christ. That we might lay a hold of him. That we might be delivered from our sins. Just like he delivered the children of Israel out of the nation of Egypt. He delivered us out of the dregs of sin and death. But it not only reminds us 
That is, he executes in the office of king that he subdues us unto himself. But he rules and reigns over us. He leads us in our daily lives. His word is a lamp unto our feet. It is a guide to our path. It gives us direction. As we follow Christ, he will lead us where? Into the pastures, the places where the still water flows. Even if we walk through the valley in the shadow of death, we will fear no evil, for Christ is our leader. He directs our steps. He leads us where we ought to go. He rules us, and He also defends us. When all the enemies rise up against us, He conquers all of His and our enemies, even the enemy of death. So it reminds us, the mighty act of God there in Numbers chapter 23 through 24 is reminding us of the very same thing that this table is reminding us of. That Christ delivered us from sin. That Christ has brought us into life. And that Christ will give us this life that never ends. As far as the eye can see, the aloe trees will stretch. The gardens will extend. The rivers will flow. The flocks will feed. The lion shall lie with the lamb. The child shall play with the ass. There will be no death. There will be no sighing. There will be no destruction. Because Christ has destroyed the very last enemy. The enemy of death. As the grave could not hold him back. You see the children of Israel didn't understand everything that God was doing. Because God was doing it behind the scenes. It's like Job didn't understand everything that God was doing. Because it was all behind the scenes. You know what? You and I know more about Job than Job knows. Because God has recorded it for us. You and I know more than Israel knew. Because God recorded it for us. And what God is saying to us is, as you meditate upon these acts, remember, I am doing that for you right now. I am conquering all of yours and my enemies. And I will defeat that last enemy, even the enemy of death. So God calls us to his table. He calls us to remember that mighty act. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. I was dead, but now I have been made alive in Jesus Christ. God invites us to his table. He come and he says, come to the table and feed upon me in remembrance of me in this great work that I have done. Jesus said, the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11, put us back in the context, remember Paul's telling us in 1 Corinthians 10, remember what God did back there in Numbers? He did it as examples to us to remind us that God is doing this work for you and I even right now through our Savior, Jesus Christ. He who sits upon the throne will never be removed because his throne is forever and ever. So as we come to this table, the Bible says that Christ in the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it, saying, this is my body which is broken for you. And he took the cup and he blessed it, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. As often as you eat of this and drink of this, you do what? You do proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. What does that mean? Jesus died? No. It means that he saved us. We proclaim that glorious, propitious death. That death that turned away the wrath of God. That death that took away my sin. That death that made me right with God. That death that gave me opportunity to come boldly into His presence. You do proclaim His death until He comes. That one and only entrance. That one and only way into the presence of God. And as we come, Jesus says, Come and eat at this table in remembrance of me. Remember what I did in Moab. Remember what I did at Calvary. That you might be aware of what I'm doing right now for you and in you and with you. That's my people. And so Jesus says, come to the table of the Lord.
But the table is not for just anyone. The table is only for the disciples of Jesus Christ. So the scripture's invitation is not to come one and all, but it is to those who have trusted and put their faith in Jesus Christ, having joined themselves to the church of Christ through baptism, that he invites to come to his table. Because it is those to whom the promise is made. Those who are his children. So as you are members here at Shiloh Orthodox Presbyterian Church, or members at a uh, Bible-believing, Bible-preaching congregation, we invite you to come to the table of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But the Bible also gives us this admonition and warning. The Bible reminds us that not only is this a table that represents my union and communion with God, and that as I eat of this table, I must do so in faith and my trust in God as my Savior, but it is also a table of communion in the body of Christ. We who have been, are, have been many have been made one in Christ, and so if we have aught against our neighbor, or we know that our neighbor has aught against us, we must be reconciled to that one before we come. If we know that we're living in unpenitent sin, we must confess our sin before him before, he come, before we come. Jesus tells us in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5, if you come to the altar, and you realize these things to be so, leave your gift at the altar, go and be reconciled, come back and come to the table of Jesus Christ. If you recognize that you have unrepentant sin, it's not a deterrent to keep you from the table, but the scripture says, confess your sin. He's faithful and just to forgive you of your sin and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And he calls you to come to the table of Jesus Christ. So let us take a few moments this evening and search our hearts and try our ways. If there be any wicked way within us, let us make confession to Jesus Christ. If we have aught against our neighbor, let's go to that one and be reconciled. And then, as God's people in covenant with Jesus, trusting and believing that He is the King who has subdued us, the King who rules over us and defends us, the King who conquers all of His and our enemies, has invited us to come and to eat of this table of blessing in Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Our gracious God and Father, how we are ever thankful for the great work of salvation that you have given to us in our Savior Jesus. Father, we were wretched, miserable, and undone sinners, but by your grace. You have brought us out of darkness into light, out of the kingdom of Satan into the kingdom of your own dear Son. You have done more abundantly than we could have ever imagined or thought, and now you invite us to your table. You give to us freely of the bread of life. You give to us freely of the water of life. You have come and you have said to us, Eat and drink. Ho, everyone that thirsteth, and he that hath no money, come, buy, and eat. Eat heartily, you say to us. And it is our desire, O oh Lord, to come in humble obedience, in thankful obedience, in worshipful obedience to your table this evening. So, Father, as we come to eat of the fruit of your field and of the fruit of your vine, we pray that you would bless it to us for its intended use. That as we eat of this bread and drink of this cup by faith, we might feed upon the body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.